This is Peter Kent. As a broadcast journalist, giving voice to pictures was my job. Giving voice to data is my new job. Welcome to the Monthly with Government Analytics. With Canada and the world's post-pandemic economies gripped still by continuing economic crisis, too much inflation, too much money, too much demand, too much productivity slack, as Russia's war on Ukraine takes an added deadly toll on the battlefield, on global food supply, and on allied unity, on top of all of this, democratic governments are being forced finally to address communist Chinese petulance, arrogance, and belligerence that threatens global trade and conflict with democratic Taiwan. Yet another huge challenge in the rebuilding of the post-COVID global economy. So who better to discuss the China files than a former Canadian ambassador to China, a career foreign service officer with postings across the Indo-Pacific at APEC and on the Canada-China Business Council. David Mulrooney, welcome to The Monthly. Good to be here, Peter. Thank you very much. Now, on Sunday, as the uh, People's Liberation Army was launching uh, fake air attacks and sea attacks, firing missiles into the waters adjacent to Taiwan, you posted a tweet that said, Beijing's post-Pelosi tantrum has brought chaos to the movement of people and goods in East Asia and added to global tensions already inflamed by Moscow's brutality in Ukraine. Remember, you said, that the next time China asserts that Taiwan is a purely domestic issue. Can you expand on that? It's, it's to say that you know, for many years, um, China has simply refused to have a discussion about the fact that Taiwan has over time evolved into something else. And, and history is important here because uh, Taiwan was a barely remembered uh, piece of the Chinese empire, offshore, rarely visited. Uh, but in 1895, as the Chinese empire was imploding, Japan took over Taiwan. It gained control of Taiwan and ran Taiwan until 1945, until Japan's defeat in the Second World War. And then the US Navy, in fact, was running uh, Taiwan until uh, the defeated Nationalist Army uh, fled across the Straits, about 100 miles across the Straits, uh, to take up governance there. So the People's Republic of China, the republic that Mao established in the late 40s, has never ruled Taiwan. And over those intervening years, from uh, 1949 till now, the people on the island have grown. They've gone from a dictatorship to a democracy, and they're really something else. They, they've acknowledged the fact that uh, something has happened to them over time. And the only people who refuse to acknowledge this are, are the Chinese, the, pe the people in Beijing. They refuse to accept the fact that they should, they should have approached this more creatively and humanely. So we now have to, I think, challenge that, that claim by China that it's nobody else's business. And as I say, you see it reverberating in Japan and in Korea and in Singapore. And you feel it reverberating more broadly as we begin to think about the emergence of Ukraine or of Russia and China as two very belligerent forces in an otherwise orderly world. You've also made the point that despite the headlines over these past few days since uh, Speaker Pelosi uh, visited Taiwan, this has actually been building. The Chinese pressure has been incrementally being increased for some time. People are referring to this as the fourth Taiwan state strait crisis. The third was in the Bill Clinton era when uh, China was displeased with Taiwan and fired missiles again. So they, they're describing this as the fourth. But in reality, my, my sense is that it began well before the Pelosi visit. And the current leader of China, Xi Jinping, has been increasingly aggressive with Taiwan. And over the last three years, has been ramping up sorties by uh, Chinese fighters and bombers uh, across the midline of the Taiwan Strait, designed not just to be symbolic, but to wear down Taiwan's air force and to test Taiwan, Taiwan's air defenses. So China is changing the status quo long before uh, Speaker Pelosi's visit. And you know, people say, well, it wasn't a good time to visit. I, I ran the Canadian office in Taiwan, and every time 
uh, um, we had the opportunity to attract a minister to visit Taiwan, Ottawa would say the timing isn't good. The timing is never good. Uh, it, it, that's that's just a, a fact. But the reality is that it's happened. Uh, Speaker Pelosi has a long history with Taiwan. She reached out to the leader of Taiwan, who is one of the most amazing leaders in East Asia, a very com competent woman who has risen steadily through the very challenging world of Taiwanese politics. So in many respects, it was a visit to be uh, saluted and, and acknowledged positively uh, by everybody other than China. Uh, let's take a moment to uh, ju just bring up a, uh, a, free, a frame grab that we took yesterday of shipping in and around the Strait of Taiwan and around Taiwan itself. Steve, uh, could you put that, uh, that graphic up? This was a, uh, a live graphic. Each of those green and red dots represents uh, vessels. But as the uh, incursions to both uh, Taiwanese airspace and sea space increase, one is considering more and more the predictions of perhaps China moving, if not to immediate conflict, but to a, a blockade, which would interrupt all of, the, as you said, interrupt all of this traffic and trade and people. That, that's very true. And so um, you're already seeing Korea, South Korea and Japan um, quick, quickly trying to uh, scramble and um, welcome flights that would otherwise be uh, destined for Taiwan. Uh, international shipping uh, in that part of the world is, is in chaos. Uh, and, Ch and China is probably using this to practice, to test its readiness uh, to enforce a blockade around Taiwan. And they seem to, they've come a long way since that last crisis I mentioned, the one in the Clinton era. Uh, but at the same time, it's one thing to mount a, a blockade for a number of days. It's another to mount it for the number of months it would take to bring Taiwan to its knees. So uh, I don't think we need to panic. We need to take, uh, you know, acknowledge what, what China is doing. The other thing that it is probably rehearsing, and this was I think Taiwan's foreign minister uh, referred to this. It's it's rehearsing a larger strategy. Taiwan is the immediate objective, but the real objective, the ultimate objective for for China is to force to make it impossible for the U.S. Navy to operate in the Western Pacific. So in the waters uh, to west of, of Guam, around Taiwan, around Japan, uh, and around South Korea, the presence of the U.S. Navy since the end of the Second World War has uh, enabled. East Asia to develop into an economic powerhouse, a regional economic powerhouse. It, it has enabled the democratization of Taiwan and Korea. It has enabled the orderly redevelopment uh, of Japan. So this isn't something that as Canadians, we can look by and say, well, that's interesting, but it doesn't affect us. It directly affects us and it, directs, it affects our allies. Uh, and I wanted to just pick up on that sure. point. When, when Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, the democracies, surprisingly, for the first time in a long time, came together almost instantly and supported uh, uh, both military aid and sanctions. And although NATO has stepped up and uh, proclaimed China as a security risk for its co coercive policies to challenge the interests, security and values of the alliance, as that, that joint statement said, uh, many individual countries, including Canada, have been somewhat more cautious in their condemnation or criticism of China. Is that because the economic realities are simply so much more significant? I, I think you're, you're, you're charitable in, in describing Canada's responses as more cautious. I think it was actually cowardly. And for many years, um, the business sector and many governments have failed to acknowledge the reality uh, of the threat that, that China poses. I was just reflecting on the fact that the Winter Olympics went ahead as planned in Beijing, as it uh, was maintaining prison camps for one or two million Uyghurs, uh, whole, turning the Western region of China into a vast prison camp itself. It is basically erasing Tibetan culture. It's squeezing the last drops of uh, democratic governance out of Hong Kong. We've, we've ignored that and, and pretended that um, it, 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 it's not consequential. What at, at heart, this is a failure to understand and appreciate China risk. Uh, again, you had made a, a, a very uh, 
telling comment uh, some months ago as things began to heat up with China uh, that basically said a real China policy for Canada will require action rather than rhetoric, uh, doing things rather than just saying them. And, and you added a big challenge for our badly broken foreign service. It, it, can you amplify on that and, and where we aren't with regards to a, a meaningful, coherent China policy? One of the most um, instructive and important chapters of my professional career was working on Afghanistan and working to make sure that the Canadian civilian contribution in Kandahar was aligned with what the military were doing. Yes. When the, the mission began, uh, it was described as this unique military-civilian partnership, uh, and nothing more was said. And I've described it as, it was as if you, you dump the elements of a, a structure you have to build onto a table and assume that it will assemble itself. And it took a lot of work there was a manly panel, uh, which the Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Harper, accepted accepted all the recommendations. Parliament approved uh, their recommendations. And we set to work building the structure to implement this. And, and that, that took a lot of effort. And there were all kinds of stresses and strains. China is much more important than Afghanistan was. Yet our, our policy towards China seems vastly less connected. So you need to have your foreign policy in sync with your uh, military policy. You need to have a security policy that recognizes that the China risk is no longer out there, but in here, we seem far away from doing that. And, and to be very honest, this government's record on doing just about anything is, is pretty poor. So the Foreign Service, I think, is weaker than it has been in a long time. There is no coherent uh, China policy, and there's nothing like a, a coherent Canadian foreign policy in place that would enable us to do what needs doing. It's not impossible to do this, nor is it too late, but gosh, we've got to start thinking about it very, very soon. Uh, a former um, diplomatic uh, colleague of yours, uh, Randolph Mank, uh, said a few days ago that Canada seems to have a policy of strategic procrastination on major geopolitical issues. Uh, and Randy's bang on as usual uh, about that. Um, but my particular concern is it's not, even if we weren't to focus on the wider world, but just to focus on China, that'd be pretty important in itself, because the significance of China is not only it, its power and influence, and we're seeing some of that today, but as I say, the fact that it's no longer an out there issue, but an in here issue, that China has targeted Canada. We saw evidence of this in the Meng Wanzhou uh, era in the Meng Wanzhou crisis when they, they essentially held two Canadians hostage. But we also began to see the extent to which at least some opinion in Canada was that we should simply capitulate, uh, that they were so worn down, we're so overawed by China, that there's almost a kind of a moral fatigue in some corners of the country. We've also seen troublingly in, uh, evidence of Chinese interference in, in Canadian politics, where uh, media, uh, Chinese language media, began to target one particular party, the Conservatives, and suggest that they were guilty of, of their, their China policy was nothing more than racist. And that seemed to have an impact on the results and writings where there were diaspora communities. China's doing this in other countries as well. This is part of their strategy. It's written down. They talk about it. So we've got to think about not just China as out there, but, but in here. And the country that after the United States is probably most influential in Canada and not influential always in very good ways. Well, and that brings us to uh, uh, several more slides and graphics. Uh, Steve uh, Saunders, if you could put up the first one and just remind folks that uh, uh, Canada's major trade partner, the United States, uh, where 76 of our exports go and where 62 of our imports originate from, uh, we have a uh, uh, at the moment, uh, uh, a $1.3 trillion uh, advantage on our total balance of trade with the United States. Um, and we see the United States today uh, uh, having relations or trying to breaking relations on a number of, uh, of uh, cooperative programs, both uh, related to, uh, to climate and technology. And go to the, uh, the next slide now which shows 
Canada's balance of trade with China. Uh, again, China takes a very small uh, percentage of our exports, about 3%, but more important, 9% of Canada's imports still come today directly from China, uh, and uh, even more comes indirectly through the United States. Now, the final slide, and uh, uh, David Mulrooney, uh, this speaks to your point of, of dealing with allies and the disruption of allies. Uh, it shows that the major economies of the Indo-Pacific account for fully a quarter of Canadian exports. Uh, that's uh, Australia, Hong Kong, India, Indonesia, Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan. Uh, and 28% of our Canadian imports come from the region. So the economic uh, reverberations of what's going on now between China and Taiwan, uh, and as you've described, the lack of a, of a coherent Canadian policy on China uh, leaves all of this up in the air. It, it's very much up in the air. But I think it's important also to, to look at some of the things that are happening in China itself. So 10 years ago, the world was, as I say, in awe of China because it was really the only country that, that managed to get through the economic crisis and, in fact, did some good for the rest of the world by keeping demand alive. Things have been happening in China, though, that uh, suggest that it, it's no longer going to be the, the economic powerhouse that it has been. It'll be a, a, an important country. It'll be an increasingly prosperous country. But the idea that it would very soon, within this decade, overtake the United States as, as the largest economy in the world, I think, is now under, under question. And that's under question for a number of reasons. One is the current leader, Xi Jinping, uh, has decided his, his focus is not so much the uh, economic growth of China, but the survival of the Chinese Communist Party as a means of governing China. And that's not peculiar to him, but the extent to which it's taken, he's taken this is, is significant. And so what he's done is he's been quite willing to hobble some companies to blunt the growth in some sectors to be sure that uh, popular uh, sentiment is, is appeased. So um, Chinese people were frustrated with the vastly growing education sector. They're, everybody's trying to get their kids into university, so there are cram schools and tutors and, and things like that. He's, he's regulated that. The Chinese property sector, which is it controls and represents a significant part of the economy, is in a total mess, and she is allowing and holding the, the the CEO's feet to the fire in that sector, in part because it has it, it, they've done such a poor job of of providing housing to to China's people. Uh, he has taken steps against major CEOs who have too high of a, a profile. So. He's a public profile and could be a, a threat to him or to the party. So he is very willing to see the, the economy uh, suffer a little bit if that ensures that the, the Chinese people remain supportive of the party. And the other thing that's happening that I think we have to be very mindful of is demographic change in China. China is aging very, very quickly. And at some point, I think within this decade, it will fall to second place in terms of populous nations and India will overtake it. And that's happening for a number of reasons, the disastrous one child policy, but also as in most societies, as they get more prosperous, uh, people decide to, to limit the size of their families. That's particularly true in China because as they say, education is so important. So China is getting older very, very quickly. How significant is the mortgage protest by those members of the Chinese middle class who are refusing to pay their mortgages on unfinished buildings because they're not sure that they will be delivered. But this is happening apparently across the country. And that's right. It's, it's a, something that's fairly unique that in China you 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 start you pay for your your uh, home before it's it's built. And what's happened is that the Chinese uh, property giants uh, are also as they grow spreading into other sectors, electric vehicles, soccer teams, uh, food and beverages, a lot of this fueled by debt. And so they're now increasingly cash strapped. The uh, pandemic has also slowed construction. So this has generated a great deal of frustration. The absolute number of you know, projects that are affected by this boycott is still small, but it's got Chinese banks very, very worried 
and th there are a lot of concerns that this could could spread. So Chinese people aren't happy about how the property sector is being managed, and problems in the property sector uh, will reverberate uh, powerfully to the to the Chinese economy. The, the other long term issue is. If we look at what we buy, sell to China and what we buy from China, we buy you know, consumer electronics, uh, some strategic uh, material, some, some um, rare earths, for example, that we can't get elsewhere, uh, but it's mainly manufactured goods. China it buys from Canada uh, pulp and pay, pulp. Uh, it buys uh, minerals. It buys agricultural products. But the long term for China, as it, it, it runs out of water, as pollution uh, contaminates soil, uh, is that China, and, and as the diet of Chinese people change to be more like our diet, um, is that they will increasingly need the things that Canada produces. So um, although China is riskier, we've got to understand that we are ultimately, I think, in the driver's seat in terms of that relationship. Well, what is your advice to the lobster fishermen in the Maritimes to the uh, to the, the the various grain producers, given all of the uncertainty today with China, uh, and the Chinese record uh, in the past of sometimes breaking contracts uh, when when they don't like the way the numbers fall. Well, I'm a Nova Scotian by birth, so don't get me started on lobster. But I, actually, I was very proud of uh, companies like Clearwater that went from selling block lobster meat to the the Food, food industry to ultimately selling lobster with a little uh, sleeve on the claw that showed the maple leaf and, and Chinese consumers wanted to buy a nice clean Canadian product. I think there'll always be a market, but I'd say don't depend too much on it. We need to diversify and we need to develop markets in some of those and, and strengthen markets in some of those other, um, other countries. I, I had a lot of experience with canola, you know, from Western Canada, yes. the oil seed. Um, it, it, China is by far the most important market, and I've seen twice China close that market to Canadian products, to Canadian canola. What's interesting is uh, Chinese farmers began to uh, seek, uh, and Chinese food process began to demand uh, canola for their uh, uh, oil crushing operations. To me, the long-term strategy there is one, don't be too dependent on the Chinese market, but also to diversify so that we're selling processed canola, canola oil, canola meal for, for cattle, rather than the seeds, uh, just canola seed. The other thing is, I think the long-term challenge for Canada is not just market development, but improving our infrastructure so that we can deliver these products. And gosh, improving our energy infrastructure would be yes. uh, number one. And um, cutting back on the kind of regulation we've seen recently that makes it almost impossible to export to the world the things that Canada produces and the world needs. If we could get that right at home, we would see our trade picture improve, acknowledging that uh, China is not going to be the market that we hoped it would. It'll be an important market, but it's not going to be the world leader um, that we thought it was 10 years ago. At the same time, there's plenty of room for the Canadi Canadian trade with Taiwan to increase. Yes. And uh, Taiwan was uh, it was an interesting case because they, they can be tough sometimes too in terms of uh, market access issues. Uh, but Canada has played a, a key role in, in bringing uh, uh, Taiwan to the table in, in trade negotiations and welcoming them into the world. There's an awful lot that we have that uh, they're interested in. Uh, we should be focusing again on Korea, um, not giving up on, on Japan and developing some of the markets in Southeast Asia as well. But again, having the infrastructure to deliver goods in a timely basis, uh, moving up in, in terms of the value uh, ladder to uh, further processed goods, those are really, the, I think, the Canadian strategies that we have to look at. Always confident that countries like Canada and Australia will continue to be able to provide things that countries like China need desperately. So two things from, from that last uh, statement of yours, and getting back to the pursuit of the long overdue Canadian coherent policy on, on China, the foreign minister, Minister Jolie, has uh, created a, a 14 member panel, uh, which has been meeting in secret so far. Uh, but we understand that there is fairly sharp disagreement that the, the panel is uh, somewhat deadlocked, uh, because there are those on the panel who, who favor uh, continuing as we are seeking, seeking uh, uh, a free trade agreement, for example, which 
seemed to be a dead letter uh, matter some some years ago now. Uh, at, while the others on that on that panel uh, would like something uh, more pragmatic, something more realistic. What 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 have you heard <laughs> through the well, grapevine? I'm, I'm, I'm sort of out of the loop on that, and I think people are for a number of reasons. Um, and I, I I don't put pressure on my colleagues, but they're they're probably a little afraid uh, to to talk to me about that. But I've watched it from afar, and it's a little bit like you know the process of building the Great Wall. It's taken an awful long time. <laughs> um, that said. Um, I, I think they're approaching it the wrong, wrong way around. You can't contract out something that important. Uh, this is something that the, the prime minister and the foreign minister and key ministers of cabinet should be leading on. And it shouldn't take three or four years. There's some very common sense stuff that's going on. If we just took a few uh, notes from what the Americans are doing, what the UK is doing, what Australia is doing, and it hasn't taken them years uh, I think we could put together a, a solid policy that would be in sync with what our allies are doing. And what it involves to an extent is, is a, a, a thoughtful and intelligent decoupling in areas where we have been vulnerable to China and a new approach to uh, alliances and partnerships. We're, we're still very much UN centric, which I think you know, has, has some benefits, but it's, it's kind of the foreign policy of the 70s. Australia has been looking at new partnerships, and it's in one with the United States and, and yeah. uh, the UK. Uh, it's in one called the Quad that also brings in India yeah. and, and Japan. It used to be, and you'll remember this from your many aspects of your career, Canada was always one of the first countries to be invited into partnerships, in part because yeah. we brought resources and we also brought ideas and a unique, unique Canadian gift for consensus building. We're now more or less the last kid picked or the the uh, you know game of shinny, we're we're, we're not uh, top of mind. I just sometimes look at lists of important countries that are you know coming together, working together. I don't see Canada mentioned all that often, and that's uh, that's a tragedy. Again, it's not too late to change that, but um, we need to. Uh, if we were to indicate that uh, we share this objective of coming up with a, a more realistic China policy that we're prepared to work with our allies, we're prepared to invest in things that you sort of have to have if you're a player in the Pacific, like a Navy. Um, and if we began to work on our infrastructure and and some smart deregulation, we'd be invited back. But it, I, I, I think it may be beyond this government to achieve. Well, and to the point that Canada has been left out of a number of these new relationships among our Indo-Pacific allies, uh, the government has responded uh, in several cases that those groups are not important, that, that we belong to the, the most relevant and this other, these other things are talking about submarines and, and uh, matters that don't concern Canada, but they do. They absolutely do. And if you look at Australia, it, I, I think, feels more vulnerable. That's no reason for us not to feel vulnerable. It has also had uh, experience of Chinese interference. It has also had its citizens detained and, and, and imprisoned. Uh, it's also had uh, economic boycotts and economic pressure. And it's responding uh, creatively and taking responsibility for its own future. We seem unwilling or incapable uh, uh, of doing that. And, and it, it, you know, I think the problem is we, the government tends to see foreign policy as, and I, I don't want to be naive, uh, there is always a domestic political calculation to be made, but it's not purely domestic politics. And especially now, as we are a little bit more isolated than we were, we need to think about investing in the kinds of things that um, middle powers, serious middle powers have, like armed forces, like the security system that actually works, and like an economy that is uh, connected and shows an interest of being uh, connected to the wider world. And um, until we start doing that, I think we're going, to, uh, we're, we're going to be drifting the way we have been drifting. And what's, equal, what's even more worrying is something I referred to earlier, which was that kind of moral fatigue we saw during the, the Meng Wanzhou uh, crisis where people were, what, what China was doing there, I think is, it needs to be seen in context. It wasn't just an effort to get its citizen back. It was also an effort to get Canada to change how it is governed. Um, we have an obligation. We have a, a, an extradition treaty with the United States. 
China was trying to get us to say, yeah, you can have that treaty, but it just doesn't apply if anybody that we consider important in our system is arrested. You have to change your approach to extradition if you want to have a, a viable relationship with China going forward. And there were a lot of people who saw that as just fine. And you know, if you think back in, in, to Canadian history, there was a time when we wouldn't ever have considered that, that, that serious people would have been immediately you know, shut, shouted down if they had proposed it. Uh, and I was very worried for a while that, that that position might hold. My heart went out to the families and, and to the, the, the folks who, the, the two, two men who were imprisoned. But to change and, and to begin a, a, you know, an approach to sort of vassal status uh, for a country like Canada seemed way too high a price to pay. When Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, the rethink of Canadian domestic defense policy came to the fore once again. Uh, North American defense, uh, Canadian Arctic defense. Uh, uh, but Canadians should be re reminded, don't you agree, that as things have heated up between China and Taiwan, we have to uh, remember again defense against a potential adversary uh, on the Chinese mainland. Thank you. Um, I, I was saying that I, I was serving um, in the Canadian High Commission in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, uh, when uh, Canada launched its then new uh, Canadian, Canadian patrol frigates. And so I was in Malaysia for the maiden visit of HMCS Regina. And uh, when the ship and the ship's company arrived, um, the Royal Malaysian Navy was keenly interested in what Canada had to offer in, in some unique Canadian technologies on the ship. Uh, there was a very good discussion with uh, the Malaysian Navy and also with uh, the Navy down in Singapore about Canada's interest in the region. Uh, the ship's company also got involved in some charitable works. It was a tremendous advertisement for Canada and Canada's concern. So simply having the ability to project Canadian identity into the Pacific is important, but it's also important for another reason. And that is to say that when Canada and Australia and the UK and France and Germany and others show up and they travel through the Taiwan Straits with their, their, their Navy, they're reminding China that this isn't just a Sino-US issue, that serious countries around the world are concerned. And China may bluster through this, but the very conservative old men, and they're mostly all old men, although I have to say that I'm, I'm the same age as Xi Jinping now, so that I <laughs> have to acknowledge that. But although they won't acknowledge it, they begin to get worried when countries that they see as serious are collectively expressing concern about China, uh, China's behavior. So our uh, inability to project our voice in the region um, is is coming at a cost to us in terms of how we're perceived. Now, the United States adheres still to the one China policy, but is obliged by law to provide the means for Taiwan to defend itself. Should that support be extended, do you believe, through the allies in, in uh, a, a more unified position statement? I think the way to to do it, uh, where you really get into trouble with China and and pressure generates is when you signal what you're doing too soon. And I think one of the problems with the Pelosi visit is don't tell them three weeks or four four weeks out. Give her, give them a heads up, but make it a few days in advance. So when you hold things like that out there, you you almost force a Chinese response. What I would do is simply start welcoming Taiwan officers to staff schools in other countries, looking at ways where we could work together on fisheries protection and anti-piracy campaigns and, and things like that, uh, and begin to normalize this. Is it provocative to an extent? But as I say, China is already militarizing its response to Taiwan. It's already yes. taking the steps. And we will look back and regret this and say, why didn't we act more then? So China's changed the status quo time for others, including Canada, to think about doing something similar. Now, just to wrap up, uh, Canada recognized communist China in 1970 uh, and cut ties then with Taiwan. I remember uh, covering for the CBC the Montreal Olympics in 1976 when uh, 
on the eve of the Olympic Games opening, the uh, International Olympic Committee threatened to call off the games because Prime Minister Trudeau, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, uh, had barred the uh, Taiwanese team to compete in the games under the Taiwanese flag, uh, and they didn't come. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau at the time shrugged off international criticism with a quote, those people who still believe there are two Chinas. Now, the two Chinas policy is still the policy of the United Nations, of the democracies respect that two China policies. So David Mulroney, to, to wrap this, this conversation up, do you see a day when the one China policy may turn to a two China policy, a, a China policy and Taiwan? recognition of Taiwan. Uh, I, I hope for that day, and I pray it will come. And it's not, uh, this isn't, uh, I think, a faint hope. It is possible. But what I think we have to wait for is change in China, so that China becomes sufficiently politically mature to accept the fact that it needs to engage Taiwan respectfully and acknowledge what has happened over time. This may sound unrealistic, but one of the models I've thought of is, is the Commonwealth. If China had said, what we're going to create a structure where we celebrate uh, our common culture to the extent that it's shared, and by the way, not all Taiwanese people, as you know, think, think of themselves as Chinese, we should be careful that we don't attribute an identity to uh, people in Taiwan that they reject themselves. But there are some aspects of Chinese culture that still exist. If we can celebrate these things uh, culturally and build our trade ties, but acknowledge that you, your own um, autonomy, I think the Taiwan, Taiwanese would have accepted that some time ago, as long as it allowed them the scope to, to, to tell the world who they are and, and to uh, enjoy the full uh, benefit of their, of their autonomy. But until that happens, and that's gonna take remarkable change in China, we will have the, we'll have to manage this difficult situation. The danger is, that we're not so careful in its management, and this has been the case for some time, that we allow China to steadily erode uh, Taiwan's uh, scope room to maneuver. As we see uh, China knocking off the last remaining uh, diplomatic allies of Taiwan, even in the Vatican's uh, new uh, discussions with, with the Chinese, um, the fate of Taiwan, which the, the Vatican recognizes, is, is an issue of concern. We, we've got to stop that trend and say enough is enough. Here's where we are now. And China, over time, we expect you to uh, understand this and acknowledge this reality too, if you want to be part of the community of nations. David Mulroney, thank you very much uh, for your generous sharing of time and enduring the uh, unpredictabilities of, uh, of uh, the technology which, uh, which connects us. Uh, thank you again for on behalf of the monthly and to our audience, uh, which has endured with us uh, until next time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And, and uh, thank you for your, your patience and, and to your team. Giving voice to data is the monthly with government analytics.